can start right now. Travis, you want them louder any place based on what you saw last week? You're yeah, just good. project like you're talking to the back of the room. Okay. French philosopher Franz Fanon once said, quote, each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover their mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Every day on the news, we hear people discussing the current greatest threat to humanity. ISIS, climate change, gun control, wherever the conversation leads, we are in the same place. Your beliefs are labeled as ignorant, perhaps idiotic, and you just don't understand the world that we live in. Since 1976, there have been 17 separate government shutdowns in the United States. These shutdowns were fueled by a range of conflicts, stemming from nuclear aircraft carriers to abortion. And it is evident that these conflicts stifle our progress as a nation. So, how will we become the generation that is able to drop our egos and work across the aisle? How will we be able to end this constant trend of polarization? As I took on the task of writing this talk, I found myself constantly struggling with my own personal bias. I am so utterly loyal to the narrative that my news source feeds me. So, when that narrative was challenged by my research, I struggled. But this struggle and frustration scared me. Why am I so afraid of the opposing view? And why do I get so angry or annoyed when anything other than CNN is playing on the television? But this problem isn't just a personal one, but rather a national one, and some would argue even a global one. This inability to acknowledge the existence, let alone with the legitimacy of the opposing view, <coughs> leads to a loss of something that is so vital to our humanity, our empathy. Over the course of history, our empathy has proven to be a strong force of pushing for justice and reform in every corner of the world. So what happens when this empathy is stripped away from our humanity? Of course, I don't know the answer to this question, and quite frankly, I hope I never find it out. However, the current nature of this world scares me because we are so unable to work together. But why? Why are we so unable to work together? To answer this question, I think it is most helpful to look at one of the most polarizing elections in our history, the 2016 election. It is no question that this election will be studied in history courses forever. Donald Trump's victory shocked the world. And I think it is fair to say that many of us generally accepted that Hillary Clinton was going to win. But why? Why were we so shocked by Donald Trump's win? To answer this, it is essential to look at one of the major outline polls, the USC LA Times election poll. This poll was one of the only major outline entities that predicted Donald Trump's win for the majority of the time. This polling agency has always had a very reputable reputation, and its methods were simple, asking people who they were going to vote for and their likelihood of voting. So why, suddenly, was this poll receiving frequent and loud denunciations from many Democrats? especially as the election day near and passions rose. It seems pretty ridiculous that someone would criticize something that seems so logical and so simple. Well, the critics of this poll reflect the feelings I addressed earlier. These critics simply did not want to acknowledge the possibility of Donald Trump's victory, and thus they discredited every source that suggested its probability. And today we see this as a trend in our society. It's accepted that people can now look over facts because it challenges the way they view the world. And entities like this, ones that hold their legitimacy in their dedication to the real fact, are now suddenly ignoring them based on bias. The LA Times also studied public perception. Essentially, they asked people who they believed was going, they believed was going to win. It's amazing how out of touch we can be with reality. We as the public, walk through this world every day. Each day brings new experiences. We read the news, we talk to our friends, and we go to work. How is it possible that we are exposed to so much, but yet understand so little? People don't actually believe that right, is a common phrase that we use today. We think the scope of our understanding stretches so far and wide, so how could we ever be wrong? But when we look at how factioned our everyday lives are, it's pretty amazing that sometimes we actually manage to be right. 
A recent Pew Research poll reported that despite people's faith and politics, they generally are very uncomfortable when people start to talk about politics and argue about politics in front of them. But the poll also reported that those most willing to share their opinions were the far left and the far right. For whatever reason, the independent, moderate, or third party is left out of this equation. And this is a significant part of our division. Because of limited representation, we start to build assumptions about and reputations for every registered Democrat or Republican. Suddenly, every Democrat becomes a socialist, and every Republican becomes a warmonger. And until the outliers start speaking up, this division, this cycle of division is going to, um, this trend of division is going to persist. So, our generation, often found being either moderate or nonconformist to either political party, has a duty to start speaking out as well. Research shows that two-thirds of 18 to 29 year olds find social media as the most helpful means to gathering all of their political information. Well, initially, maybe this doesn't sound too bad. I mean, social media exposes us to so many new ideas and it gives us a means to express our own. So, Maybe this isn't so bad, but this isn't an ideal world. Because polls report that nearly half of conservatives mostly see posts that match their politics, and liberals are most likely to block others based on political content. So, because we are not talking in the real world, but we are also unfollowing others and blocking them because their opinions challenge our view of the world, this cycle of polarization is not going to end with us. This newfound technology also presents us with the opportunity to read news online. Now, we are able to access a range of news sites with so many different opinions and views. However, polls report that 64% of Americans get their news from just one site. And like social media, we could just say, hey, this statistic isn't that bad because at least they're reading the news, right? But what we fail to realize is just how biased our news sources really are. Michael Moore, a popular American filmmaker and political commentator, was one of the few, like the LA Times, who predicted the win of Donald Trump. He wrote about his prediction on his blog. I have even more awful and depressing news for you. Donald J. Trump is going to win in November. This wretched, ignorant, dangerous, part-time clown and full-time sociopath is going to be our next president. <coughs> Moore then goes on to refer to Trump supporters as Billy Bob and Billy Bob Joe. Of course, Moore certainly has the right to his own political beliefs and opinions. However, in doing this, he is depicting the entire right as uneducated and ignorant. And in doing so, he is furthering their narrative that they are looked down upon and overlooked by the left. But of course, the left is not the only side responsible for this. Ann Coulter, a popular conservative political commentator, was asked to react to Hillary Clinton's email scandal on a Fox News interview, saying, quote, I just think Hillary Clinton is really dumb. We all knew Bill Clinton was the smart one. At least her husband was molesting the interns and lying about it under oath. With her, it's always something that is so stupid. We should get her SAT scores. Later on a blog posting, she refers to Clinton supporters as self-righteous PC enforcers who follow a self-actualization movement for people with emotional issues. Like more, Coulter has the full right to her opinion. But in expressing it, she is again demonizing the opposing view by denouncing them as emotional, smug, and unable to think for themselves. Again, she is furthering their narrative like more. Both Moore and Coulter have starkly con contrasting political opinions. However, they both use the same tactics by discrediting the other side, by insulting their intelligence. And then, this encourages their followers to do the same and this culture of hatred and anger disseminates throughout the population. In an ideal world, we could just tell people to shut up, news sources and political commentators, and you know, look at politicians to just get the real facts. But the problem is that our politicians are not immune to this dangerous generalization. I'm sure we are all aware of Hillary Clinton's comments which she referred to half of Donald Trump supporters as falling into a basket of deplorables. And Hillary Clinton did apologize for these statements. But comments like these, especially when coming from a presidential candidate, are extremely dangerous because, like Moore's comments, they further the right's narrative that they are overlooked by the left. 
Donald Trump supporters even made t-shirts that said, proud member of the basket of deplorables. And it is evident that her comments did not weaken the right, but rather unified them and started a culture of, I don't want to talk to them because they think I'm stupid, and I don't want to talk to them because they are stupid. But again, the left isn't the only side responsible for this. In 2012, presidential candidate Mitt Romney was caught on tape saying that 47% of the country was going to vote for Obama because they were lazy and didn't want to work. Again, the public responded with outrage at these comments. Over half of them, when polled, viewed these comments negatively. So why are our political commentators and presidential candidates constantly making such generalizing statements that damage our nations only to appeal to their base? Maybe it is convenient to make generalizations in order to simplify your life and organize your thoughts, but what are the costs? Now, I'm not asking that we start censoring our news sites, nor am I suggesting that we live in a perfect world. People will fight, bicker, and shut the other side out. But all I'm asking is that we start questioning the words of our favorite politicians and of our favorite political commentators. The world is full of pro problems ones that threaten our lives, our rights, and our humanity. But how are we ever expected to solve them if we are so starkly polarized? During the election season, a Pakistani journalist traveled to Alaska in hopes of trying to understand why Donald Trump was gaining so much support. On his trip, he talked to fishermen whose whole lives were at stake based on potential Clinton fishing regulations. Upon returning from his trip, he reflected about the election, saying, I realize that for many of us supporting Hillary, this election was about incredibly important social issues. It was a moral election for us. To most of the people I met on my trip, it was about survival, literally. Sure, there are racist Trump supporters, but what I failed to recognize during this election was that there are people voting for Donald Trump for reasons other than racism, immigration, and sexism. I lacked empathy for anyone I couldn't automatically relate to, and thus, I shut out any of their opinions. But we won't stop seeing elections where economic survival is voted for at the cost of important and vital social issues until we start listening to one another. You may hate the rhetoric of Donald Trump and everything that he stands for. You can, and certainly have the right to, express your emotions, protest, and reject or support the president-elect. But please, don't reject half of this nation by labeling them as idiots or ignorant. Instead, reject the rhetoric that they voted for, but still vow to work alongside them to find compromise. Listen openly, show empathy, and work inclusively to ensure that this never happens to our country again. Thank you. So take a breath. You were the brave one, going on your own. You crushed it. Yeah, great. Killed it. Sorry. <laughs> Guys, observations? So good. Really good. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay so I love how you did your time.
our TED Talk is, he's a nice boy, are you sure you want to report this? Sexual assault on college campuses. Because this is a 21st century class, Grace and I wanted to focus on a topic that is not only relevant to this time period, but this specific time in our lives. We are the incoming freshman class, the most vulnerable and uninformed group on college campuses. While we're all excited about our newfound freedoms, there are some things we should be aware of. One in every five women are sexually assaulted on college campuses. That is 20% of the female population. This is a huge number with many contributing factors. We want to not only inform you on what these factors are, but prepare you for how they may affect you and your college experiences. So in order to do this, we knew we needed to not only research statistics and data extensively, but talk to you, our peers, to gauge a sense of what knowledge you had and what understanding gaps you may have as well. How many of you have ever been told by a parent, a friend, a teacher, or advisor to steer clear from the creepy guy in a moment in the parking lot? Or told, or told to walk to stay away from a creepy old man in a van? Or told never to walk home alone at night? While these are all situations to steer clear of, they infer that the primary threat to your safety is a stranger, or commonly termed stranger danger. While this is some while this is important, it is it is in fact statistically untrue as 90% of all sexual assaults are committed by someone that you know. This means that your classmate or acquaintance is statistically more likely to sexually assault you than a stranger. Hence the title, he's a nice boy, are you sure you want to report this? This was said by a college administrator to a rape victim and is one quote of many others just like it. This statement introduces a huge amount of gray area not only to this specific situation, but one we notice amongst our peers as well. What we found is that people have a preconceived notion of what a rapist should be. So the idea that a nice guy or a preconceived friend could commit such an act is something that's difficult for people to accept. Picture if you were in an administrative position put in charge of facilitating sexual assault reports. If someone you knew, someone you truly believed to be a good person was accused, would that influence your response? This is what has led colleges to put such an emphasis on the issue of consent. It can become a gray area, one of which with, mixed with alcohol can be almost impossible to sift through. This has led to a widely held belief that false reporting is a huge issue in this area of crime and causes colleges to be reluctant in taking those reports seriously all the time. However, this is not, should not be the case. As a rare maximum of 8% of sexual assault reports are false, although usually closer to 5%. Of which, 5%. Why this is such a huge concern for colleges is unclear, because oftentimes, or in almost every other federal crime, the chance that the report is false is the exact same as sexual, as sexual assault. So what makes rape cases, cases so different? In 2012, 45% of colleges reported zero sexual assaults. This could not possibly be true, as stated earlier, that 20% of women are sexually assaulted. This statistic alone proves that assaults are actively being underreported. As stated by a former dean of students at UNC, what you do is you make it difficult for students to report. So you don't have 200 or 1,000 reported assaults. So you can artificially keep your numbers low. Artificially. Reporting is not only made difficult because of the possibility that a sexual assailant can be a nice guy. So what other factors are at play here? There is an underlying fear of what can happen to, a repu to the reputation of a university. With official rape report reports comes bad publicity, which has the possible effect of deterring potential donors or students. This thought process is proven, as stated in The Hunting Ground a documentary featuring the testimonies of administrators, victims, colleges, deans, and professors alike that quote, when a student has comes to a prop administrator with a problem, it's not as if that administrator wants that student to be harmed. It's not as if the administrator wants the harm perpetuated, but their first job is to protect the institution from harm, not the student from harm. 
So what does all this mean? It means that colleges, if put in the position to do so, will sacrifice the safety of their students to maintain their reputation. As said by a Princeton administrator, schools are actively and aggressively not wanting to tell the truth about what's going on in their campuses because the first campuses to do so will be known as the rape campuses, where they actually have a rape problem. But rape is happening on all college campuses, and the perverse economic and reputational incentives is to hide those numbers. Why hide these numbers, one could ask. It is stated here, the perverse economic and reputational incentive, or in other words, financial stability and reputation. Colleges financially benefit from their alumni as they are a huge source of donations. And 60% of all alumni donations come from Greek life alumni. Fraternities, however, happen to have the highest rate of sexual assault in college, while women in sororities are 74% more likely to be sexually assaulted than any other women on campus. Under the recent Greek life, sororities and fraternities are directly linked. This link unfortunately extends past just social events as shown by the fact that sorority girls have a higher chance of being sexually assaulted and fraternity members have an elevated rate of committing sexual assault. Frats clearly have a huge influence on campus, and with this influence comes power. We wanted to give you a moment to silently read some phrases we found frats chanting around campus or some slogans they thought to be appropriate. This is not to villainize all fraternity members, as we realize this is not applicable to every Greek member. In fact, less than 8% of men commit 90% of sexual assaults. This percent, up, this percent is made vastly of repeat offenders, meaning that if addressed and removed from campus, could be significantly reduced. Or one would hope. Between 2009 and 2013, 135 sexual assaults were reported at Harvard University. Ten of these reported assailants were suspended. We use the term suspended lightly because many colleges, not just Harvard, suspended students over summer vacation, after graduation, or over the course of a day. Couldn't one consider suspension after graduation to be simply graduating? This is unfortunately not, and zero expulsions. This is unfortunately not the only college with statistics like these. Other punishments included a $25 fine, a poster board on how to ask someone out that you like, and a warning. Between 1998 and 2013, at University of Virginia, there were 205 reported sexual assaults, zero expulsions. In this same time, 183 people were expelled for cheating and other honor board violations. This clearly shows a prioritization of other offenses over sexual assault, a federal crime. So if these categories have the, of infractions have the same chance of false reporting, why is one taken seriously and the other is being pushed aside? Keep in mind, as stated earlier, that the false reporting rate is at a rare maximum of 8%, but is usually closer to 2 or 5%. So we did the math. Let's take Dartmouth, for example. If there has been a total of 155 sexual assaults in the past 11 years, and we factor in the rare maximum of 8%, that would still leave 143 cases to be true. However, only three of these 143 guilty cases resulted in expulsion, which is roughly 2%. And keep in mind that the majority of these cases are made up of repeat offenders. So just think how reduced this number could be if proper punishments had been instilled. So what can you do about all this? Know your rights. Title IX is a gender equity law that gives all students, regardless of gender, the right to an equal education. By not expelling your assailant from campus, your college will be contributing to a hostile learning environment and therefore an unequal one. If your university does not put your learning and safety over first, be it proactive. Although Title IX has been around since 1972, it was not enforced. No one was making sure colleges were following these rules. 
However, within Obama's presidency, progress has been made, as shown by the fact that over 50 colleges have recently come under federal investigation for their handling or lack thereof of sexual assault. Schools are required to address sexual discrimination and harassment. The excuse that schools are not equipped to handle situations like these is invalid because all colleges are required to have experts on campus, Title IX coordinators, as well as a procedure that is written and handed out to every student on campus that says what to do and how to file a complaint if you are ever sexually assaulted. A Title IX coordinator's sole responsibility on campus is to oversee Title IX's involvement in sexual assault reports, as well as identify and address any patterns or systematic problems within the handling of reports or samples. By deterring victims from formally reporting, your college will be doing the exact opposite and is therefore in direct violation of Title IX. Your school has a responsibility to ensure that a victim can continue their education free of harassment or violence. By not removing your assailant from campus, who are statistically proven to more times than not commit a sexual assault more than once, your college would not be removing a threat to both your emotional and physical health. This is not just a women's problem. One in 16 men report sexual assault on campus. Although rare, our information applies to all of us. But what we can all do is really be aware. While false reporting is also rare, it's important to avoid situations that could land you in a gray area. The lines of consent can be easily blurred. People often bring up your fight or flight reactions in, this, in a situation like this. However, another commonly left out reaction is freeze. Just because someone is not actively resisting or running does not mean consent has been given. No still means no. Awareness is important, but so is support. Men, women, colleges, and victims alike share the responsibility to be honest with each other. This means working together and not against each other to cover up what happens on campuses. All four components have a part to play in addressing the issue and educating each other. With this, along with our research, Campbell and I were able to conclude that rape and sexual assault is not limited to extreme or random acts, but is a consistent and prevalent issue in almost every college in America. By understanding your Title IX rights, having an honest dialogue with your administrators and peers, and supporting victims and colleges alike, sexual assault can be effectively addressed and effectively reduced. Although progress has been made and is continuing to be made, sexual assault is still a huge issue and extremely prevalent on college campuses. We hope that you leave here today not only being aware of how vast this issue is, but with a better knowledge of what to look out for, your rights, and what policies are or should be accessible to you if you ever find yourself in a situation like this at your university. Thank you. Thoughts? Um, I think it was clear that you guys are both really passionate about, I'm like, I'm like laughing, like, really passionate about your topic and like really knowledgeable. I think it was really clear that like you put a lot of thought into like what your argument is going to be. Oh, like, but you like kind of like combat, like presented like the kind of commonly held conception of what rape looks like and kind of combated it to show like it's not really a stranger. And most of the time, like, like school.